Greetings. Welcome to a new episode of Art Matters. I'm Wayne Quackenbush, your host, and I'll be interviewing a couple of uh, Rhode Island artists today. Uh, I'd like to introduce our first guest, Jeff Palmer. Um, he's a very prolific uh, artist, graphic designer, painter. Uh, he he covers a lot of surfaces. He shares a lot of images. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Wayne. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. So I've only known you a brief time, and I will say that we met through the benefit of social media. Yep. Uh, you are uh, prolific, and you post prolifically on uh, Instagram and your work caught my eye, and that's why I, I contacted you, and mm. and uh, that's kind of why you're here today. So, tell me a little bit about your background and your your uh, developing interest in art. Sure. Uh, well, I've always been interested in art. I've always been, you know, um, maybe dabbling with it. You know, painting, drawing as a kid. Uh, but it wasn't till high school, college when I fell in love with film, actually filmmaking, cinema. And that was really my uh, career for the most part. Um, videos, uh, video directing, music videos, short films. Um, and so I went all the way even uh, several years ago to get my master's at mm -hmm. Boston University in cinema and media production to teach. And I did teach mm -hmm. and I love teaching um, yeah. film because stories, uh, stories uh, with, with you know um, lots of personal meaning and um, and so uh, we, we moved to Rhode Island, um, and I didn't quite have all the teaching opportunities presented to myself. So uh, I still kept my toe in that, um, in those waters, so to speak. Uh, and when the pandemic hit, a lot of the video work that I was doing kind of dried up. Dried up. Yeah. Yep. And so right around uh, the Breonna, uh, Breonna Taylor, um, George Floyd marches and, and protests, uh, I just sort of, it sparked something. And I started to do some, some word art, some sort of protest art, mm -hmm. if you will. And, uh, and that's kind of what, what kind of got me interested in doing more of it. And I just kept, mo at that time, it was mostly paintings. It was abstract art. It was very, uh, you know, big colors, big splashy colors. Um, and I eventually, right around Thanksgiving, I started to do uh, lino cuts, or li lino cuts, lino cuts, uh, block printing. Yeah. That's basically where you take a linoleum block and you uh, carve it out. You, you carve out the positive and leave the negative and uh, throw some ink on it and then make a print. Yeah, in, it's in a big, big rubber stamp, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. except and it's linoleum. Yep, mm -hmm. and, I, and I started with linoleum, <clears throat> and then I started with then there's this thing called Speedy Carb, which is like just basically like a giant eraser, and it's softer. It's easier to, easier to cut, but it's squishier, so you have to be sensitive about the pressure you use for, for printing, because it kind yeah, of... I wondered how you were able to do them so quickly, because you, uh, you can do several in a week, and... and my experience with linoleum blocks is that it's not a quick process usually. It, it, well, it, when they're really the, the, the linoleum is very hard, so you have to have really sharp tools, and um, and the, those can take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I've gotten, I think I've gotten faster over over my learning curve, and and so right now, yeah, I, I if I really wanted to, I could probably do two. Um, it doesn't mean you know they're going to be. <laughs> In, you know, 100%, but, you know, I, I try to not worry too much about perfection. And a lot of your work is basically, you would say, came right out of the headlines. Some of it is, yeah. But then, you know, so something like this. So this was one of my earlier um, Rhode Island prints. So we, my wife and I moved to uh, Rhode Island and, mm -hmm. and uh, got a house in, in Cranston, and that's where we're at right now. And so... I started to get really uh, sort of, um, you know, fall in love with Rhode Island, so to speak. And um, where are you from originally? Uh, I am from New Hampshire originally. Okay. Yep. And then we spent ten years in California, and then uh, moved back to New England. 
So I started to pick up on the Rhode Island um, themes. You know, we get, here's the roadie red, the state bird. Right. Um, <laughs> and this was actually part of a, my friend Missy out in the Northwest put together a, uh, one of those weekly cha or monthly challenges, and it was a bird a day. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to try the Rhode Island, uh, you know, state bird. So, so did you thir do 30 Rhode Island reds? No, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a Rhode Island red a day. Um, I I did that, and I did a version of uh, the Crow, the movie, the Crow oh, yeah. with Brandon Lee. So yeah. you know, tying into the the Crow thing. Yep. And because I love film, I wanted to take on David Lynch. Yes. And it wasn't until I decided to include his tw his iconic Twin Peaks curtain background with the striped you know uh, floor. Mm -hmm. And, and sort of mesh that, mel meld it together with him. And this is actually a larger version of the block print. A lot of the block prints I do are four by six, uh, but this is a blown up printed version. How, how does the color come into that? The color, so the color is basically um, on the block, it's, it's red colored pencil. Okay. So everything you see red is basically clear, like the white, and I just, you know, added it. I see. A lot of people can do, you know, double double blocks, but um, right. I just added. And because I love art and uh, Basquiat, I yep. decided to do um, this and this. So this is actually a my block print put oh, on a screen. Keep it perpendicular oh, so the audience can see it. Yep. Put on a screen, and then I used a yellow uh, spray painted <clears throat> mask. So I did the yellow like f brisket. yellow first. Yep, yeah. and then whacked it with the uh, the, mm -hmm. the print on top. So um, I have you know Basquiat. I could put him on a T-shirt and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, that's that's eye-catching, and obviously he used that crown as one of his symbols in his paintings. And right. Yeah. So I just figured I'd you know bring it in. Anything that's iconic, eye-catching, you know, easy to easy to understand, easy to comprehend. This one always this one kind of throws me a little bit because uh, first of all, it, it's of a time period that we can't access anymore. Right. Like a lot of a lot of younger people wouldn't really recognize that as a telephone and then the whole the whole banana thing, I mean it kind of makes you think of uh, surrealism, but of course sure. it's an old vaudeville joke. I yeah. can't hear you. There's yeah, yeah. a banana in my ear. So where did that come from? Well, I know <laughs> like people are always making the joke about, you know, yeah, bananas yeah. and, you know, the, you know, they say like if a kid hands you a banana, always answer it, you know. I've um, never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a well, I have two nieces, so, you know. <laughs> oh, really? Because yeah. it's like... There's bananas and yeah, pajamas. Well, uh, Wasn't there a cartoon show? I don't know. Yeah, the banana splits, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, that's a whole so anyway, other thing. Anyway, it's it's colorful, it's playful, it's fun. You know, Andy Warhol did his version of you know the banana with velvet underground. Of course and, he did. Yes. Right. So Very it, it sort of it sort of harkens back to a lot of that. Um, <clears throat> and then you know I did uh, so I also let me show you this one. <laughs> Maybe you'll recognize it. Maybe you won't. Do you know what that is? Uh, of course. It's uh, our, the former vice president and the iconic fly that landed on his head during the <laughs> right. vice presidential uh, debate. Yep. And, you know, what this I love about this piece... This is an example of one of your quick paintings. Yeah, yeah. So this was exactly. So the, it happened, and that morning I got up and painted this. And um, I brought it to one of the places that I show art at, and, uh -huh. you know... People love to laugh, and they just, you know, they see it, and they point at it, and they start laughing, and then there's a conversation. And that's what I love about doing art. That's one of the things I, and, and filmmaking too, but art is like, it's so immediate, it's so quick, it's right there. You have your captive audience. Yeah, it's almost like a, what you're doing is almost like a, a, a cartoon a day, a political cartoon. Yes. At, uh, and uh, uh, for instance, uh, you did a Charlie Watts picture recently, because he just passed away. Yep and uh, everything is, is timely. Do you have anything that people, that you don't get a good reaction from? You know, I, 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 I do get things that don't get a reaction, mm -hmm. yeah. I, not, maybe not a negative reaction, but um, I, I do, you know, I, I will, sometimes I'll think I, you know, just you, you know, knocked it out of the park or something. I was like, you know, I, I feel very strongly about it, and it just kind of, it just uh, sits there and doesn't really go anywhere, and people don't react to it and that's totally fine you know because yeah, yeah. I'm not making art 
to make other people happy. I think primarily it's to make myself happy. And yeah. if and if somehow it catches on and people people dig it, um, like this right here. Yes, is, you need to talk about that. I definitely need to talk first about this. First, you have this. to so say what that is. First of all, I have to ring it. Um, so basically, this is uh, Christopher walking on a cowbell, and I think we all know the. Uh, well, maybe you don't, but it's a Saturday Night Live skit where he, they parodied, parodied uh, Blue, Blue, Blue Oyster Cult, um, recording a song. More cowbell. See, I didn't ring. even know that. Oh, I remember it on Saturday Night Live, and it lives on in the internet because yes. even even kids that have never seen Saturday Night Live know what that is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I carved. Christopher Walken on a block print this big, mm -hmm. and then uh, turn, turned him into a sticker, and then just put him on a cowbell. So that gets a lot of laughs. It really does. And I think that, that just that connection with people is what, for me, you know, sometimes I don't consider myself a fine artist. I think of myself as a fun artist. Yeah, that's, that's and, a good way to put it. And uh, yeah, so just kind of keeping you know, making a connection through the art um, and whatever stories people want to share or reactions is, is great. So, uh, like this is, Iggy Pop was on my list of folks to, uh, to carve and I uh, recently did one, uh, I think this one was yesterday. Hmm. Yesterday. <laughs> so, because I was uh, at a show last night and I wanted to have something fresh, something new. I'm always trying to do new work because mm. um, I, I, I don't want to always be kind of relying and falling back on old stuff because you know it's great to have it but um, I and think it's just really a, I'm you must have a catalog in your head of what you want to do but yes then, then something will happen and then oh I have to do that today totally yeah yeah, yeah. I, I uh, you know it, like you said it could be a current event it just could be you know someone's birthday that shows up it could be um it could be any number of things well he, this is one that i am particularly proud of and and people do react to this strongly mm -hmm. um, positively and i wanted to uh, kind of give rosie the riveter uh, an update for 2020 right um, instead of you know we can do it it's you kind of looking back um sort of at the you know women's movement it's like we've we've been doing it right um and sort of updating the you know the it, character it makes rosie you stop and think and you don't stop with just the prints though because i've seen your stuff on uh towels you can yep show yeah the, so this is uh, another uh, rhode island design you've made you've made banners um yep so this is uh, our, our, I call him Quint, Quint the Quahog, uh, and he is very cool. I'm glad you're able to share with people the right, the right way to pronounce uh, the Quahog. <laughs> because a yeah. lot of people will it's come tricky. to Rhode Island and... It's tricky. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I know. Oh, and yeah, that's another... Yeah, here's another, another one, the, another iconic... State icon. You might, I don't know if you can fit this in the screen here, but here's the... Here's the big bug uh, that we drive by on 95. And so I, I kind of came up with the small state big bug logo motto. And that's another thing about a lot of the things I do is I, I, I come from graphic design and there's a lot of copywriting involved. So I, yeah. I, I try to fold that, bake that into the image because, you know, the image can stand on its own. But I think sometimes people like a little catchy catchy also phrase kind of or to something stay every, under everybody's radar too yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so nobody so there's no lawyers start calling you up and do us <laughs> yeah i know i'm waiting for that yeah and the, maybe the last thing here is uh this is a sort of a three-dimensional piece with a with a paintbrush uh, a palette and you know kind of spray paint with some stenciled letters art nerd which i think i uh, am i can consider myself a 100 percent art nerd and that would make a great t-shirt well, I think we kind of reached the end of our time here. Right, and I Wayne. really want to thank you for hanging out with us. Yeah, and it's been sharing fun. your work. Appreciate it. Thank you very Can much. Can we go out with a cowbell? Yep. More cowbell! <laughs> Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, an artist I've known for a number of years, Carol Scavato. Welcome to the show, Carol. Thank you for inviting me, Wayne. This is lovely. <laughs> uh, we've known each other for a number of years and our satellites keep crossing paths. Uh, I first met you through the shows that uh, Ricky Gagnon used to do up at uh, the juvenile um, 
prison? I think they called it a de detention center because yeah. they didn't want to call it a prison. But that was an interesting yeah. uh, venue. It was, it was a very interesting venue because you were exposing artwork to people that would not normally see artwork. Yeah, and the, and the, and the people that were there were invited to participate, and, mm -hmm. and not only in producing artwork, but in uh, interfacing with the public during the opening. It was really fun. It was a great, it was a, a great <coughs> platform. Now, at that time, you were working on, um, a, I would say, a large picket fence installation, and each of the pickets were humans, like human beings? So my work has consistently been about people. That particular installation that you're talking about, they were, they were boards, mm -hmm. like a picket fence, and I had them hinged so that they would sway if you touched them, just like a person, and they had paper masks face faces and they were all holding um, an iPad and if you got close enough you could see what they were looking at on their, on their iPad and that installation was about how you and I are sitting we're actually talking to each other but quite often I'd be on my phone you'd be on your phone and be going hey Wayne what are you doing mm -hmm. and not interacting so that was about the lack of internet the lack of um, people interacting on one on one yeah and you had it with that installation you had to get that close and get that involved to realize that you're looking at their phone and them involved <coughs> now your work has always incorporated uh, the figure at least from what I've seen it really does and it's it's more about humanity and the movement of people and the people of interaction these earrings that I have on right now when I graduated um, a long time ago. <laughs> I graduated as a sculptor and I worked in metal, I worked in all different mediums. And when I went into the real work world, I needed to make a living and so I turned it into a jewelry business. Mm -hmm. So if you see these, they're actually, I think there's six parts on this and they wiggle and they dance like little dancers. And they're all hand cut and hinged together to make them dance and, and wiggle on your ear and so my work has been consistent throughout my life basically mm -hmm. but the mediums change and somewhat the focus changes depending on what society is doing and how I'm responding to it yeah I've seen you do some social commentary too right I remember you did a series a few years ago that was heavily I would say in tune with the Me Too movement at the time and that was kind of what precipitated the work that I'm doing now mm -hmm. which brought me back to um, more intimate type work because I was doing works that were, they were collages, which I didn't bring any, but they were collages of me um, taking photographs of myself and putting myself in different positions of um, uh, social, very difficult social situations, um, child uh, sh uh, shootings, you know, school shootings. Mm -hmm. So there's me with a gun at, waiting at the bus and two little kids, so I'm small enough I can dress, so they were costumes. I was dressing in costumes, mm -hmm. and then they were all with doll faces. Mm -hmm. And I spent a couple of years with that series and delved into a lot of really heavy, um, emotionally heavy things to think about. Yes. And it, the work itself was time consuming, but they were, they were very, very hard to be doing. And it was time to, I just needed to back away and, and go back to the f where I started yes. <laughs> and this painting right here behind me was actually done before that they were done after the earrings but before I had done that series that I just was discussing those were called the selfies because I'm in all of them but this painting here it's just so joyful it's called laughter and it's just so joyful of like oh you're it's a tickle whatever it is it's it's sensual and it's intimate, but it's, it's not offensive. A mm -hmm. four-year-old, a 40-year-old, a 400-year-old mm -hmm. can go, yeah, that's kind of, kind of sweet. And it is a sweet piece. Yeah. From there, I moved to working with high-end papers. And so the, the idea of it is the same thing as far as this is just one woman and not a combination of two people. Mm -hmm. but working with the the textures of the paper became extremely important so they started as drawings they went from drawings to collages they you know developed but they were they still are about people's interaction and the name on that one i think it 
was called waiting for my date. <laughs> you know, just sitting there patiently and I'm all dressed up and, um, you know, she's got a little heart on her. So there's humor in, in all of my work, mostly except for that one series I was talking about. Right. Now, uh, you've also done some performance work. I remember vividly seeing you at the Jamestown Art Center. Yes. And uh, you were dressed in a wedding gown. Right. And you were reading letters that your parents had sent each other. Th that was a that was a, a very emotional thing to do. So, yeah. So, my parents, my my mother's from New York, and my father was from Western Mass, and they met. In those days, women didn't go on vacation by themselves. But my mother, I never thought of as an athletic person, but went to. Um, a dude ranch by herself, and my father went to a dude ranch by themselves, and they met, met, met there. So it was, you know, a three and a half hour ride between. So they wrote letters. Wait, there was a dude ranch either in Mass or Rhode Island? I don't know where the dude ra ranch was. <laughs> okay. This was a vacation that they went to somewhere and how they met. It's just really a lovely story of, of a love story. Mm -hmm. And they wrote letters for six months and got married. And so when they both passed away, I wound up with the letters tied, how my mother had tied them. Mm -hmm. It was very hard to touch them. I put them in my, my drawer and, and left them there. And I couldn't, couldn't even look at them. Several years later, I took them out. And it was like I couldn't remember my mother's address. And in those days, for, I put them on the bed and I put them upside down. And in those days, they used to write the return address on the back. On the flap. And the back. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh. And through Inst Instagram, social media, I said, does anybody, I have a lot of New York connections, does anybody know where this address is? And one particular person, I won't use his name, but he said, I do. It's not very far from my house. And I'll, I'll go over and take a picture for you. And he did. And my ver version of, of her apartment was just her door. I had thought it was small, you know, I mm. mean, but it's a huge complex. <laughs> and they had renovated it. It wasn't torn down. Mm -hmm. So that was really a nice kind of a thing. Yeah. And from there, I couldn't read the letters. It was like they were too personal. So the way I did that was to, I, um, that was my mother's wedding dress. And she was a bit ta longer than I was. So it kind of had an odd shape. but. Mm -hmm. To it, to it, and I took the letters and had them next to me. I'm not a really good reader, um, and my f their hand let writing was not easy to read. And my father was a tool designer; he wrote in pencil. So after all these years, they were light. I opened each letter. One at it. It was an hour and a half the first time I did it. That second time, when you saw me in Jamestown, was the the last few that I didn't have time, and just read them one at a time cold without knowing what it, it was very nerve-wracking I had no idea what they were going to be saying to each other you know whether it was going to be like embarrassing myself or my parents and it was like texting it was like I found a coffee table um, it was really like texting back back and forth so it was really a very um, a very round circle of uh, um, complete circle for me to do that to yeah address it, was, it must have been some kind of catharsis it really it. was and, and it was a, a a sense of uh, going back in time and, right. and visiting with them. And visiting with them when they were younger young. than I was, than when I did it. Yeah. Yeah, they were young So people. the first time you read them, that wasn't live, was yes. it? Oh, really? You yes. did it? As wow. <laughs> so okay. it was real nerve-wracking. Yeah. And I did that at AS220. Okay. Um, and I did a lot of performing with AS220 at the time. Um, and now I know most of the people, but at the time I didn't know a lot of the performers, and it was easier to read it in front of people I didn't know. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> if it was, yeah. my my brother still has not read them and has not listened to me read them. So D different uh, di different siblings. I think it's an honor to them. He thinks it's an invasion. But uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I I know siblings have uh, differing opinions hmm. on stuff. It's like not a, that. it's not a problem between yeah, us. But yeah. you know. He didn't say, oh, don't do that. I mean, yeah. it's just he chose, chooses to not read them. Sure, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I know that you're working on stuff constantly. I see stuff all the time on your I Instagram page. I am very, page. very busy. Mm -hmm. And so what, what happened after that same series, we were, the selfies we were talking about, I went into just drawing, back to drawing figures. And they, mm -hmm. were, they were two figures that were drawn pretty much not as one line drawing, but they were ink drawings on lovely Japanese paper. And so they were two figures that created a shape and created an intimate intimate shape. 
And that worked for a while. And then it became that, that they were the substance, the, the substrate was not supportive of the intimacy of the work. That's when I started, I switched s to silk. So this is Dupiani silk. And so, the, and it's all um, outlined with silk threads. And so, so it's, it's embroidery. Mm -hmm. And so <coughs> with the, back to with my mother's dress, of stepping into my work, I actually become very, very step, I very much step into the work that I'm doing. And with embroidery, it, this one is small, but the ones I'm doing now are bigger. They're draped all over me, so I am really part of the piece sure. as I'm doing it. Yeah, I never and thought of it that way. It completely. And so now this one's really pretty humus, humorous, because I think there's a lot of humor in my work. So she's, you know, put, doing her hair, and, you know, she's getting dressed, and she, it says, I'll be right down, I have my blue shoes on. And so, <laughs> so you know, it's, it's just the, the intimacy of people's lives are what attract me. Um, not that you have the job that you're run the biggest corporation in the world. It's the intimacy of, yeah, but I don't like tuna fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the details. It's in the details, and you're, you can bring more work up, and you're, you're basically working with the space between people and how sometimes there's no space between people. And as far as how, how the shape <coughs> that people, just the, the shape of people interacting with each other creates a shape on the whole page and in, in a story within the story, but the, the whole shape, it's, it is a lot to do with. I do them outside on, on paper before I, I don't directly draw them on ink, uh, in ink first. I do them on paper so that I have the composition working because it's really only about the strength of the line. Yeah, you wouldn't want to just try to do that mm -mm. cold, no. Uh, you know, there's a million things I erase because there's so few lines that if the line isn't 100%, then, then the piece doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So these were very lineish, and as you can see, there's, you know, they're, they're starting to come off, and she's got, you know, her hair, which is all silk and mohair. And where it, they're going it looks now? Looks like you have. Well, obviously, there's a lot of uh, Asian influence. It, they look like th this one in particular looks like a Japanese woodcut. Exactly. So <coughs> back to my mother, as far as how much someone's parents influence them. My mother collected Japanese artwork. And, oh, she did. Okay. And so I grew up with it. And mm -hmm. so I don't think any of it was particularly valuable, but mm -hmm. um, it was around me all the time. And the 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 amount of information you can get from very small lines or very um, minimal lines yes. is, is really uh, fascinates it's me. It's the, the shape and the width and it's, there's a lot of storytelling in the line work. In the line work. Mm -hmm. And so these, as you can see, they're developing and now they're developing more and more into Japanese type, type stories because they're becoming more sto like a storyboard. Mm -hmm. uh, and this one is called, um, I kind of forget the name of this one. Um, sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> but they're getting to be more and more of a story. Like a, um, some of the Japanese artwork uh, in the Endo period was, they were really, they were done as, as um, stories of the daily life. Yes. And so so they, they were, kids were involved, bathing was involved, hot baths were involved. So, so it was all kinds of things that were... Now you go like, oh my goodness, you, your your shirt fell off your shoulder, and that was just part of what that in, that period was in Japan, and a lot of their work is indicative of that, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, it's just charming. It brings you into a world that you're not, that I'm not part sure, of. Sure, they used to call it the Yukio A, the mm -hmm. uh, floating yes. world. Yes, that's mm -hmm. correct. Yep, that is correct. And uh, Carol, I'm afraid we ran out of time. Um, well, that was lovely. So happy that you came. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me, Wayne. Certainly. Thanks again for watching another episode of Art Matters. See you next time.